My uh, next presenter is a tag team group that is uh, working on, uh, worked with me all semester on uh, initiatives to fight, I'm sorry, the future of greenhouses in America. I'd like to introduce to you um, Shelly Kirsten, and she has, she's working towards her food science degree. Uh, she claims to be older than she looks. Um, she works uh, currently as a lab analyst at a cheese manufacturer. She's been there 25 years, she tells me. I don't believe a minute of it. And then also Bryce Sprecher is her uh, compadre here, and he's going to grow up to do something nerdy like cognitive neuroscience or artificial intelligence. So this is Bryce and Shelley talking to us about the future of greenhouses in America. So, as uh, Dr. Tom has told you all, our presentation is looking at the future of greenhouses in America. So what we're going to do is we're going to examine both urban and rural greenhouses in the context of local food and the diversity and food stability that they can provide. In terms of economics, as far as uh, what kind of investments are involved in starting a greenhouse, maintaining a greenhouse, and uh, what kind of money you can make off a greenhouse. And uh, last but certainly not least, we're going to be looking at uh, quite a few innovations to help reduce your maintenance costs, but also to boost your plant productivity. Farm markets offer a wide variety of nutritious foods, beneficial to both growers and the consumer. Local growers take pride in what they can offer, and consumers reap the benefits of trying new things. Polyculture is encouraged at farm markets. Polyculture provides a safety net to growers since diseases have more of a chance to wipe out monocultures. Growers have a better chance of staying competitive and offering customers interesting products, such as heirloom plants. These are all heirloom tomatoes. Would you like to try a green zebra, a black cherry, or a candy's old yellow? Just think of the diversity offered in other crops, such as cucumbers, squash, melons, to name a few. Another pro problem that greenhouses can help address, especially in an urban context, is what we've heard of as food deserts, where people don't have access to fresh or uh, nutritious food on a daily basis. So having a source of fresh produce year-round can really not only provide people with uh, a expansive local diet, but also give them much more nutritious food year-round. If we don't take advantage of fresh, healthy, local-grown food, we have a choice of bouncy ball tomatoes, like displayed up there. Um, food that is shipped 1,500 miles or more and comes as a cost to flavor and nutritional value. So a 2000 study by Rutgers University on the difference between vine ripened and non-vine ripened tomatoes found that vine ripened tomatoes have 32.7% higher concentrations of beta carotene, which is a vitamin A precursor, but it also has a 32.5% higher concentration of lycopene, or a carotenoid, which have powerful antioxidants and potential anti-cancer properties. The panel of 100 judges also um, showed that the vine-ripened tomatoes were preferred in the terms of taste, texture, quality, and overall appearance to their non-vine-ripened competitors. Out-of-season growing allows for niche products uh, or creativity of niche products. Imagine biting into a fresh, juicy strawberry, a sweet watermelon slice, or a flavorful, crunchy cucumber in the dead of winter. Or being able to purchase local, fresh-cut flowers in the middle of winter. Greenhouse growing addresses a problem of limited off-season local food by providing a year-round diverse diet. So by capitalizing on the low supply and high demand of fresh produce in the winter, one can also make an enormous amount of profit off that uh, very lucrative market. And you're also able to offer a much higher quality product than those that have to be shipped from hundreds or thousands of miles away. In fact, a 2008 study by the Florida State University Extension found that Florida pepper farmers who implemented year-round greenhouse growing were four times more profitable than their field growing companions. And they are also just able to sell their products for twice that um, in the off season as in the uh, peak growing season. I'm 
proud to tell you that my husband and I have been local growers from Adams County for the past 16 years. We started growing vegetable and flower uh, seedlings and creating hanging baskets, all without the use of herbicides, pesticides, or fungicides. We heat with wood and circulate air to keep temperature and humidity in check. We started this as a side business in order to supplement our income during the harsh Wisconsin winters. We also wanted to get a head start on our gardening since we only have a short growing season due to frost danger. We only have from after Memorial Day to about September 15th to grow outside in our area. We can give the plants a jump start by nurturing them in a greenhouse first and growing strong, pest resilient roots and stems. An aerated, nutrient rich soil is key and let the greenhouse do the work by um, bringing in lots of natural sunshine. We can get additional harvest in a greenhouse by, by growing year round versus seasonal gardening of getting only one to two plantings in in a season. So when we're talking about out of season growing, there are a lot different considerations between an urban and rural context. In an urban rural context, the goal of out of season greenhouse growing is to provide the population with food security for a healthy and diverse diet year round. And also to create uh, very kind of self affirming jobs that can help uh, bring people closer to the food supply that they so desperately depend on. So, one excellent case study for urban style greenhouse growing happens to be the Netherlands. The Netherlands has the highest concentration of greenhouse growing in the entire world. And for the Netherlands, agriculture is a very important business with a $90 billion a year revenue. 7% of that is actually directly related to greenhouse growing, which comes out to be about $6.5 billion. Yet they're able to do this on only 25,000 acres, which is roughly one quarter of, their, one quarter of a percent of their entire land mass. If we compare the profitability per acre of Netherlands greenhouse farming, we find it's about $250,000 an acre, whereas in the U.S. our most valuable commodity crop, that being corn, totals in at about $880 an acre. And so there's a dramatic profitability um, increase when you start diversifying your crops and looking to greenhouse farming. Um, this intense productivity that you get from high technology greenhouses also allows them to be the number one fruit and vegetable exporter in the entire world. They handle about 16% of the world's entire supply of fruit and vegetables, despite the fact that the country has a total landmass size about the quarter of Wisconsin. So the way that they're able to accomplish such high productivity is through greenhouses that utilize high technology um, windows and insulation techniques, uh, soilless growing mediums such as hydroponics, computer controlling, year-round growing, and last but certainly not least, um, a, a highly integrated system that they've been working on for about the past 100 years. In fact, a study on the profitability of Netherlands greenhouse growing has shown that despite shipping their products across the Atlantic, they out produce and out-profit Florida field farmers by a factor of 4 to 10. And the types of greenhouses that they use in the Netherlands are actually almost ideally suited for the types of conditions that we find in urban settings. In a rural setting, land is cheap. Uh, $1,800 to $3,000 per acre. This is our 17 by 50 foot hoop house we could fit approximately 51 of these in an acre of land. Imagine the food you could grow with a big greenhouse like that. Um, if, you wanted, if you needed a greenhouse for a smaller area, there are 10 by 10 greenhouses available for around $200. It's a very low investment. The plastic for this one cost around $1,000 for a double roll because we put um, double rolls on to have air in between for cheap insulation. And this low investment cost or lasts about six to seven years. You can also set it up and do it yourself to save costs. So whereas the economics of an urban situation, land is really at a premium price. So instead of going out with very large greenhouses, we instead want to go up. 
And because we're also uh, trying to achieve the goal of providing a year-round stable food supply, we tend to rely on permanent structures uh, instead. So while those have a higher in initial investment cost, we're also in able to implement higher tech systems in there, such as the uh, high tech glasses that I talked about to help insulate heat, and also uh, advanced computerized lighting and nutrient systems, which can help offset some of the highest annual costs of greenhouses, which are actually the heating and lighting of off-season growing. So one of the first heating innovations that we can address is natural gas heating. And this is actually a particularly excellent solution for greenhouse growing. That's because natural gas is primarily composed of methane, and when it combusts, its two products are uh, CO2 and water. And while we normally might think of CO2 as a bad thing because it's a greenhouse gas, we can actually vent this back into our greenhouses to fertilize the plants with something known as CO2 fertilization. Using high concentrations of CO2 in a greenhouse can boost yields by anywhere between 25 to 50 percent, depending on the crop's receptibility to such fertilization. Another great way to store the heat that you want is using water reservoirs. Water has a heat capacity roughly four times that of air, which means using a radiator system like this, you can cool or heat uh, air by four degrees for every one degree that you heat the equivalent amount of water. So it's a great way to store heat in the winter or in the summer, or cool in the summer. Air, <clears throat> excuse me. Air is a great insulator for keeping warmth inside and cool air outside by using it in greenhouse sidewalls. You can use air fans to keep the greenhouse warm by keeping the sides up and shutting the fans off to drop the sides and bring in cool, fresh air to cool the greenhouse down. Circulation fans keep the temperature and humidity stable. Greenhouse orientation makes sense in order to help your greenhouse uh, stay hot or cool. If you want to keep your houses hotter, you run them from north to south in order to take advantage of the sun's natural energy heating and more, over more surface area throughout the day when it rises in the east and sets in the west, and run the houses vice versa in order to keep them cooler. Shade cloths may be used as well. Um, occasionally we have to work into areas where there's no electricity or water supply. We recycled these barrels on the left and to water the plants by gravity feeding them. And this is my husband's innovative idea. He created the cedar and we used to plant seeds one at a time, taking a wet pencil lead and in water and transferring the seeds to the potted soil. And we used to, it used to take two to four people 30 days to plant 29,000 seeds. Very labor intensive. Now thanks to this in innovation, one person can plant 29,000 seeds in only three hours. It's very simple to operate. You just turn the vacuum on, you dump the seeds into the tray, and they get sucked into the precision holes and you turn the seed tray upside down over a pre-soiled pot or tray and you shut off the vacuum and voila, your seeds are planted. And the cost is very cheap. It cost my husband about $9 for the sheet of tin. We had the small vacuum cleaner and the duct tape. And <laughs> gotta have duct tape. <laughs> Commercial seeders are available like this for around $900 to $1,000. All right, so now we're going to address one of the other really high annual costs of off-season greenhouse growing, and that's lighting. So the current way that we normally supplement off-season greenhouse growing is with lamps known as high-intensity discharge lamps. But within the last five years or so, light-emitting diodes, or LEDs, have come to the point where they are economical enough to maybe start being an option for supplementing greenhouse light as well. So Currently, high-intensity discharge lamps, or HIDs, are rated at about 100 lumens per watt, and the current generation of LEDs is also about that 100 lumen per watt range. However, there are prototype LEDs available today in labs that achieve a 300 lumen per watt efficiency rating. But the light output isn't the only thing to consider when you're dealing with a lighting solution. Uh, the high-intensity discharge lamps have a lifespan of about 15,000 hours, and one of their problems is they decay in light output over their, uh, over their life. However, LEDs have 
roughly ten times that lifespan and exhibit almost no lumen decay over the 100,000 hours of their operating time. This means you'd have to buy about ten HID bulbs to get the equivalent lifetime output of one LED. Another very important factor to consider in the overall efficiency is the way that they output light. So HIDs are omnidirectional. They radiate light in every single direction. And well, that might be nice for lighting a room, it's not great when you're lighting plants because about 50% of your light is going straight up to the ceiling and not doing your plants any good. You can recover some of that with reflectors, but even then you only get about 30% of that light back. LEDs have the advantage of being omnidirectional, so you can point them exactly where you want them to be and your light will go directly to those plants. Another big issue is how they generate heat. So both of these, say they're both 100 watt light sources, will generate the same amount of heat. But HID lamps are basically plasma contained in a little glass bottle, so they radiate heat in all directions and it's pretty intense. But LEDs actually produce most of their heat in the junction area, which you're actually able to put a heat sink or a heat management device on the back of the bulb and pull the heat away from it. So what that really uh, creates as far as consequences is how close you can put those lights to the plant. With HIDs, you normally have to put them at least four feet away, otherwise you might ignite your plants, which is not a great strategy if you want to harvest them later. But um, LEDs can be put almost at canopy level. Uh, the big difference here is light decays in an exponential manner, which basically means if you're putting that HID two feet away, you're not getting half as much light, you're getting a quarter of light. And if you put it four feet away, you're only getting one sixteenth of that light output. So there's a lot of wasted light just to try and manage that heat. And uh, so we get this really more accurate actual output of HIDs are at about 30 lumens per watt. And right now, the current generation of LEDs put at about 60 lumens per watt. But there's some other implications to LEDs that allow us to do some really interesting stuff with them. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is how plants absorb light. So as we can see over here, this is the chlorophyll absorption, absorption spectrum of plants. They do really well in that, that blue range right there. You can see the chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B peaking. And uh, down in the red spectrum area, they also have pretty high absorption. But there's really like a 150 nanometer dead zone, which represents one half of the total visible light spectrum. So there's no sense in really giving plants that light if we have to pay electricity for it. So what NASA scientists have been doing is growing plants under red and blue LEDs, targeting those maximum absorption areas of the chlorophyll. And this can have some really interesting results. Uh, one study done on cherry bomb radishes found that cherry bomb radishes grown under red and blue LEDs actually exhibit higher levels of anthrocyanin, which is a very powerful antioxidant. So they have higher nutrition levels, which is great. Um, and tomatoes and potatoes, for example, actually exhibit higher disease and pest resistance when grown under limited spectrum lighting. However, this isn't really a great solution for all plants. Peppers, for example, seem to really hate this. They turn into like these strange mutated plants and they don't bear fruit correctly. So we have these uh, interesting uh, results of having limited spectrum lighting. And uh, this is only on a very limited number of plants we've done so far. So it opens a lot of interesting study for plant breeding and uh, innovation to look at novel effects that limited spectrum lighting might have on plant growth. And so last we're going to look at how might we kind of combine all these innovations together in like a holistic greenhouse sense. So for urban farms, for example, we can have thermally insulated glass to help manage our heating and cooling needs, LED lighting to really cut down on the uh, overall energy cost every year that you're going to have to invest in it, but also we can help offset that energy cost with things like solar panels or wind generators. Uh, another great thing is uh, the methane digesters and generators. So methane digesters can turn biomass into methane, which, as we've already learned, is the major component of natural gas. And when you burn natural gas and put it in a greenhouse, your plants are really, really happy, and now you have some free energy with that as well. Um, we can also integrate computer monitoring and control systems to make sure that the plants aren't suffering from diseases or nutrient deficiencies. And uh, water recycling is very easy in a greenhouse because you're able to recapture a lot of that ambient humidity and also run it through um, plant filters that will purify the toxins out of the water and get it ready for reuse. So the goals of holistic greenhouse farming is really to help provide a sustainable and diverse nutrition to uh, citizens of both a rural and urban context. Both 
Rural and urban greenhouses will maintain st sustainability by protecting our environment through innovation and technology and provide diverse and healthy local food.